This tutorial looks at electronic structure, which is a simplified way of showing how many electrons are in each shell of an atom. It relates the electronic structure to the position of an element in the periodic table, and then looks at how our understanding of the structure of the atom has changed through history. So first of all, electronic structure and how this relates to the periodic table. Before we go much further, let's remind ourselves on how we draw atoms. Uh, let's take an example, potassium, or K. And potassium has two numbers associated with it that we might be given in an exam question. It's got the atomic number of 19, and it's got a mass number of 39. Well, if we know the atomic number, we know that that's the number of protons. So we know it's got 19 protons. And we also know that because the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons, that's because the number of plus charges must equal the number of minus charges, the number of electrons is also 19. The mass number is the number of protons added to the number of neutrons. And therefore, if we know the number of protons is 19, the number of neutrons will be 39 minus 19, which is 20. We could now go about drawing the atom. We start off with a central nucleus, which will have our 19 protons and 20 neutrons in the center. And then we will draw our electrons around the outside. The first shell, of course, can take only up to two electrons. Any other shell can take up to eight. So the next eight will go on the next shell. That's a total of 10 so far. 19 to get rid of, so the next shell again will take another 8 that makes 2 and 8 and 8, that's 18 so far so our final electron must be on an outside shell like this now we can draw atoms like this, this one of course is magnesium with 12 protons atomic number 12 um, but it's very laborious to find out how many electrons are in each shell by drawing out the atom each time. Well, the electronic structure is the number of electrons in each shell starting from the inside. So in this case, there's two in the first shell, followed by eight in the second shell, followed by two. This is its electronic structure. The electronic structure tells us a couple of other things. First of all, the final number here will be the same as the group number in the periodic table and the number of shells tells us what's called the period number. Here's our periodic table. There are eight main groups which I'll label larger in red. Group 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 0. Group 0 is so called because it's got uh, no outer electrons, it's got a full outer shell. And then there are period numbers, these are the horizontal arrangements of the elements. That's period 1, 2, 3, 4 and so on. So recapping, the electronic arrangement or configuration gives us the number of electrons in each shell starting from the inside. The number of shells, which is I guess the number of numbers in our configuration, gives the horizontal period number and the final number the number in the outer shell gives us the group number so if we had an electronic arrangement of 286 this would tell us because there's three numbers there it's period 3 and because the last number is a 6 it's group 6 which would allow us to identify this as sulfur and when we look at the electronic structure of elements in the same vertical group just to confirm We've got lithium, three electrons, that's two, one. We've got sodium with 11 electrons, that's two, eight, one. We've got potassium with 19 electrons, that's two, eight, eight, one. All of them have got one in the outer shell, so they all end their electronic structure with a one. And because um, potassium has got four numbers, that puts it in period four, Sodium is in period 3, lithium is in period 2, 
This diagram doesn't show period 1, which contains hydrogen and helium only, which aren't in this part of the table. Chlorine then would have an electronic structure of 287 because it's got two electrons in the first shell, then eight, then seven, make it a total of 17 electrons. That would tell us it's in group seven of the periodic table because the last number is a seven, and it also tell us it's in period three because there's three numbers all together. Now, can we identify an element from its electronic arrangement or configuration? Here, our mystery element has an electronic arrangement of 285. So, we look at its last number, we see the last number is 5, which must mean it is in group 5. It's one of these elements. We then look at the number of numbers. It's got three numbers there, so it's got three shells, which means it's in the third of our periods. Where these cross, we've got phosphorus. The second way to check this is that we add the number of electrons together. We get 2 and 8 and 5 makes 15. And when we add the 15, we look for the element with 15 electrons. would have the same 15 protons and again phosphorus. A little bit of practice here. Hit pause if you want to have a go at this beforehand. If we've got nine electrons, how would they be arranged? Well, nine electrons would be arranged with two in the first shell and then seven in the next shell, so that would be in group seven. Element with 18 electrons would have two in the first shell, then eight, and then eight. Now, because this has got a full shell, this is in group zero of the periodic table. And finally, 19, that would have 2, and then 8, and then 8, and then 1 in the fourth, and that would therefore be in group 1. In summary then, the vertical groups contain elements with the same number of electrons in the outer shell. For example, lithium and sodium and potassium all have 1 in their outer shell. The groups are shown in red. And then we've got the horizontal periods. These contain elements with the same number of occupied shells. For example, sodium, magnesium and aluminium have all got three occupied shells and are all in the same period. Here's a past paper question on this topic. This question is about atomic structure. Look at the diagram. It shows the electronic structure of an atom. Look at the diagram of this structure of an atom. Element contains atoms with this electronic structure. Which group is it in? Well, we then look at the number of outer electrons. We can see it's got one, two, three, four outer electrons. And therefore, this would be in group four. And there's our answer, group four. Now we're going to look at the main stages in the development of atomic structure and how this was understood over a period of time in history. Looking at four main theories, Dalton, J.J. Thompson, Rutherford and Bohr, and also look at why the theory changed as new evidence was found. Although atoms were first proposed by the ancient Greeks, the first chemist who really developed a proper atomic theory was John Dalton uh, and he was in the 1800s. He did various experiments looking only at atomic weights because uh, the structure of the atom of course wasn't known but he did work out that different atoms had different masses and he said that all matter is made out of atoms and that atoms couldn't be broken down into anything simpler. He said a lot of other things as well but essentially Dalton just understood that everything was made out of tiny particles which were indivisible called atoms and that atoms of different elements uh, were different in some way. Now Dalton didn't understand that there was anything within an atom. He thought they were like solid beads. J.J. Thompson in 1897 discovered the electron and found that uh, one of the particles inside the atom must be negatively charged. And this showed that the atom wasn't indivisible, that it actually did consist of smaller subatomic particles, which one was the electron. But he just thought that uh, there were electrons in there and then and these were negative and that there must be some other positive stuff inside the rest of the atom. In 1911, Ernest Rutherford used an experiment to show that an atom must contain a central heavy nucleus. And he showed that this was a positive nucleus. 
but didn't really understand where the electrons were and figured that the electrons were just randomly scattered around the remainder of the atom. It was Niels Bohr who further developed Rutherford's idea of the atom by suggesting that yes, there was a central nucleus, but that the electrons were not randomly arranged. They were actually arranged in different shells or orbits around the nucleus of the atom with different amounts of energy. So, the development of the theory of atomic structure is an example of how the theory changes as more and more information is found, as more evidence is found by scientists. And scientists share their ideas by writing scientific papers, and then other scientists come along and try to test whether those theories are correct or wrong. And if they find out more information, then they publish more papers. And if other people agree with them, then the theory is changed as a result. Your specification says that the development of the theory of atomic structure is an example of how a theory may change as new evidence is found, and also how a scientific explanation is provisional, but may become more convincing when predictions based on it are confirmed later on.